Hello everyone and welcome to this series we're going to talk about how to power your home or house from solar power. Now first of all I have to say thanks very much to XSolar who are sponsoring this series. Uh, as you have known if you followed any other of my videos, uh, David of XSolar and his company kindly donated of his time to install solar power on my house and what I like about Exola and, and the company is that for one they have a great choice and variety in terms of products and brands. David himself, like me, enjoys tinkering and finding uh, solutions to problems so he enjoys very much getting involved in the technology and making it work well so I certainly appreciate their input. Now today what I'm going to do, this whole series is going to cover off from deciding whether you want an on-grid system, an off-grid system, the types of solar panels, whether to have a charge controller or a grid tie inverter or micro inverters, uh, battery bank, the solar panels, the cost involved, is it worth it, the complications of doing this in South Africa versus somewhere like Europe or the States. So there's going to be quite a few, few videos covering that off and what I ask you is that as I start these videos start posting your comments and questions as we go along and I'm going to try and incorporate those into the videos as they go along. By all means if the video series is, has been completed or something has been covered off and you still have a question post a comment and I'll do my best to answer it for you. And if it's worth posting a video on it I will do. What we're going to start today though is get an understanding of on-grid versus off-grid. But before I walk you through this little picture and, and discuss uh, on-grid versus off-grid and what the grid is, um, let me just show you some of the equipment so that you are familiar with what I'm talking about when I show you th this diagram and then we'll get down and explain it. Okay, so let's start off by looking at these solar panels. We are going to talk about these in detail later on and I will, might even refer you to some other videos that I've made where I talk about the performance of the different types of uh, solar panels under different conditions. So the one thing to note that today you can get cheaper panels from China and what have you but you want to be aware that if you do want to use your panels with high voltage systems, which is something we'll talk about, you have to consider the quality, the build quality and how they're put together. And that's something we'll talk about in terms of the gaps with the connectors. We're also going to talk about monocrystalline versus polycrystalline and amorphous and which seem to perform better under what conditions. This is an MPPT charge controller. So it's a maximum power point tracking charge controller and this device is something I'll point out which is especially useful in off-grid systems as it takes the power from the solar panels, it converts it, it does a DC to DC conversion so that it's at the right voltage for your battery bank to charge a set of batteries. This can't supply power directly to your house and that's why uh, this particular unit is more unit is more useful in off-grid systems but we'll have a look at that when we come to the actual diagram itself. Right so here we have the grid tie inverter. This inverter takes the solar power directly from the solar panels and converts it to your mains electricity to feed your house directly or even to feed back onto the grid. So this this unit here is the grid tie inverter and this is a normal inverter so this doesn't take power directly from the solar panels per se it can be fed from this it can pick up energy from the grid tie and it can use it but this is used to take uh, power from a battery bank and convert that to AC power to power your house so it can also charge the actual battery bank itself and I'll just show you down here I've got a large bank of lead crystal batteries. I've been doing research into different battery technology to find what is best and I've decided to go with a bank of uh, lead crystal batteries. But these are the components again that I'll be talking about in that diagram too uh, so we get an understanding of how they all hook together. Right here we have an energy monitor. Now the one reason I bring 
up the energy monitor is that one of the important things to understand when you are going to or considering adding solar power to your house you need to understand you need to scope and size the requirement of your energy source and to do that you need to understand how much energy you're using you can of course uh, have a look at your monthly bill but ultimately what we want to do in the series as well is have a look at the different monitoring equipment to either measure your household power all the individual power requirements for each of your appliances and I'll be going through the ways that you can do that with the different types of monitors and measuring equipment. Now the other thing that we'll also be talking about in the system particularly when it comes to understanding the solar energy in a South African context is the prepaid meter, the different type of energy meters that your power company can provide you with and the potential challenges that they can pose. So this is obviously the power company energy meter. This is a battery monitor and a lot of this equipment what I will do for the more advanced people is I'm going to go into individual tutorials on how on how these work and how you can configure them because these have lots of configuration parameters to make them work properly so that you can monitor your, your installation correctly. Right. One of the other things we will be talking about is how to make your house run more efficiently because the more efficient you make your house run the less power you need from your solar system which is going to potentially be expensive so here what I've done in our house this is our kitchen we used to have a set of big fluorescent tubes which chew up a lot of energy and these are LED tubes now they, these only use a third of the power that a normal set of fluorescent tubes use but there are some downsides that need to be considered with LED lighting of this kind. I have other LED lighting in, in my house and I'll, show, I'll walk you through that and try and show you when LED lighting is appropriate or not and also CFL lighting as well. We'll also then have a look at different uh, monitoring software to understand how well your solar array is actually performing. I monitor my solar array just because I'm intrigued to understand uh, what daily power I'm getting from my solar array. Out of interest I've got a, a 2250 2, watt array on the roof and at the moment at the beginning of spring if I have a a full day of sun I'll get about 12.8 kilowatt hours out of that array. On a bad day, yesterday we had a day when it was overcast and raining, I still managed to get uh, about 6.8 kilowatt hours out of it. So this is something which to understand, to understand how well your system is going to perform at different times of the year. So it, again, it, this assists you with sizing your array to cater for whether you want to actually generate money from your system or just power your house. And to understand can you power your house under cloudy conditions and how will it perform under winter. Okay, so let's get down and have a look at the, the first set of basic things to understand and that is an on-grid system versus an off-grid system. So let's have a look at a typical on-grid system and the components and potentially how they all hang together. So first of all, when we talk about on-grid, we're talking the grid would be your electrical power company or in the case of South Africa, we'd say ESCOM because we have a national power company. There is no competition. It's just one supplier. But the grid feed basically is the electricity feed which comes into your house as AC power. And that can be in the States, it'll be 110 volts. Or in South Africa, it's uh, 220. Or in, in the UK, it's 240. So that is your main grid feed into your house. Now... To get solar power onto your grid connected house, you could then have a solar panel which is installed on your roof or on your property somewhere. It can then feed a grid tie inverter. Now you remember I pointed out that grid tie inverter. What that grid tie inverter does, it takes the direct current or DC power that comes from your solar panel and it directly converts it to AC power which can directly power your house. Now this is probably one of the cheapest and most efficient ways of having a system power your, or using solar power to power your house. The other option is to use as I pointed out that MPPT charge controller. 
you could have that these dotted lines I've got going to a that, what I've noted here is a flex max which is the the model of the charge controller I have so it could feed a charge controller which then charges a bank of batteries that bank of batteries would then have to go through a separate big inverter which if you remember I also pointed out and that would then convert that to AC power to power your house now what's the problem with this system for one you go every time you go through a device like a an, an inverter or through a set of batteries you're gonna have losses which are gonna make your your system more inefficient so in this case if you didn't have the grid tie inverter and you went went through your your charge charge controller you would be going through there you'd have losses over here you then putting power into a battery which has resistance and losses when you put it in it then has to come out of that battery their losses through another inverter their losses before it goes into and feeds your house now these systems in terms of using batteries for the most part if you don't need to you don't want to use batteries because they cost a lot of money you're going to have to replace them every couple of every three to five years unless you buy a really expensive bank of batteries which can last 15 to 20 years you want batteries if you you want to cater for a power outage from the grid so if the grid fails then you have a backup source to power your house when there's no grid now in South Africa we have an aging uh, grid network which hasn't been maintained so that's one reason why I installed the, a bank of batteries to cover for outages also because at this point in time because I cannot feed back onto the grid I want to make the most use out of the solar power which is, come, which is installed on my house our household during the day probably uses ticks along on average at about 800 to 1000 watts but I've got 2200 watts installed on our roof so that can be handy because on a cloudy day even if there's a drop in the power off, off the roof I can still run my house but I'm then losing on a bright sunny day I'm losing the potential of all that power because I cannot feed it back to the grid and, and gain credit for it so what I do is I charge I go through a grid tie inverter which is far more efficient than going through a charge controller so that directly goes through the grid tie inverter and feeds my house any excess power is then pulled through the bigger inverter and charges the bank of batteries that means at night time I can then use that excess power which I've stored up in the batteries and feed that back into the house at night so that I'm not using the grid and again when the morning comes I then use that excess power to recharge the battery bank but as I said that's expensive you can get away and reduce the cost of your system by literally just having a big bank of solar panels and a grid tie inverter and for the most part in the states and Europe those are the type of systems that they use and I'm gonna refer, refer you to a link of one of my viewers called Matt he's just installed a 5.2 kilowatt array on his house and it's a wonderful production he does some aerial photography and I if you're interested do go and have a look because um, it really is a nice installation but what I want to point out is Matt makes use of another technology which is quite interesting you can see I've got a note here about micro inverters now what you can do I have one grid tie inverter for a whole bank of nine solar panels those solar panels have to be are connect have to be carefully connected so that they 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 push the power through to the grid vert, inverter in the most efficient way so that you maximize the power coming off them they are connected in series so that means if any one of those panels is shaded or is not optimally pointed to the sun it can draw down the power of the whole bank of solar panels now that is something I you, you have to be careful with with installation and something I have to live with because for one we don't we don't here in South Africa have a big market of micro inverters but on Matt's installation you can have he has one small inverter per solar panel 
and that means you get the maximum efficiency from each and every solar panel and if you have a problem with either one solar panel or in fact if you have a failure on my system of the single grid tie everything goes down. If you have a micro inverter on each and every solar panel you can still have a failure and have the whole the rest of your array up and working but just the one solar panel or inverter will be down. So let's just talk about feeding back onto the grid. In an ideal situation what you want to do with your excess power as opposed to trying to pump it into a battery bank you'd want to feed it back to the grid so that you can gain credit or even earn money back from your power company for doing that and for the most part in Australia in Europe and the US you can do that here in South Africa unfortunately we're a bit behind the times we are playing catch up it's about to happen they're about to bring in this thing called net metering which is what they you do is the meter is they meter to understand what you use and what you feed back in some cases no money exchanges hands you just gain credit for what you push back and then at night for instance you use that credit you pull back off the grid and you use that credit that you had the best way to look at that is to try and understand how that will work over a year because obviously you have to account for winter and you may generate a lot more power in summer and then be pulling back more during the winter months and so you need to try and size your array appropriately if that's what you want to do. In South Africa we have these prepaid meters so at the moment we have to have an intelligent system that disconnects the grid when I have excess power so it doesn't feed back and that I use it internally in the house. There are, we, what we can go into is a discussion on how to intelligently use that power whether it's pushing into a battery bank or intelligent load diversion and by load diversion I mean switching your load to either heat up your geyser with the excess power or switch on your pool pump when you've got the excess power so that you don't waste any of your excess energy from your solar panel. Right, so let's now look, have a look at an off the grid system. Now certainly in South Africa this is probably at this point in time one of the areas where people are willing to spend money on pho photovoltaic power. Generally speaking if you, have, if you have a farm or a holiday cottage which is off the beaten track in the mountains and it's going to cost a lot of money to bring the grid to your house it's far more cost efficient to then bring in a system a, a solar power system which can solar power your house independently. Now in the on-grid system one does want to be careful and calculate if you really want to power your house as much as you can you need to carefully calculate what your power requirement is but sometimes it's not that critical if you're going to have the grid connected because you can't always get power off the grid. You can always increase your power requirement over time as you have money but in an off the grid system you need to have enough power to power the house entirely because there is no grid. So that's where you need to understand, calculate the power requirement of your lighting, any heating, cooking, entertainment systems and try and make them run as efficiently as possible. The, the potential efficiencies that you gain in the house will, sa will save you money three times over and the reason for that is that any extra power you need needs to be cater, catered for potentially in more solar panels, potentially in a bigger inverter or charge controller and then a larger battery bank. So that's why it's far cheaper to make your house run more efficiently than have to spend the extra money in three extra places to provide the extra power for your house. Now in an off the grid system one can potentially operate far more efficiently for most grid connected systems you have to cater for appliances that are running at 220 volts or mains and as I said each time you start going through a charge controller or batteries or an inverter you start losing efficiency. In an off the grid system in an ideal world what you'd want to do is have your solar panel bring in your, your, your power, you go through your charge controller which you need to do because you need to control the amount of charge which goes into your battery bank. An MPPT charge controller 
makes the collection of power of your solar panel far more efficient. I have a video which explains MPPT which I'll link to over here. But once you've got the power coming into your battery you potentially have the option in an off the grid system to try and run as much of the household off let's say a 12 or 24 volt or 40 volt or 48 volt system. For instance if you have a 12 volt system you could potentially power your down lighters and lighting directly from that 12 volt. It means there's no inverting, it means it's a far more efficient use of the power coming from your, your power source of the battery bank. Of course you may have to introduce an inverter as I've got here so that you might be able to partially run some things off 12 volt but then you obviously might have some appliances or entertainment systems which need mains voltage either 110 or 220 and then you'll take those through an inverter and into your house. So that's an off the grid system where you don't have the grid feeding your house. Right, so I ideally hope that kind of gives a good start or introduction into solar power and in terms of showing the different, some of the different components and off-grid versus on-grid. There's lots more to discuss. Um, a lot of the questions which have been posed to me so far and particularly in for the South African market is, is it financially viable going this route at the moment? And what I plan to do is I'm going to try and do some calculations to show what systems could potentially be viable at the moment in South Africa. The one thing for me that is quite important is at the moment people need to realize that over the last four years, since 2008, our electricity prices have probably doubled. They are going to double again within the next three to five years. We also have the issue that not enough money has been invested on, on our power grid and I think potentially the same might be from what I hear, the states might even suffer from the same pro problem. They have an aging grid as well. Now if you do have those issues then potentially you're going to have more power outages and then the, the financial viability might seriously by, be outweighed by con inconvenience if you don't have electricity. In South Africa we've got a tiered system for what you pay for your electricity so if you use less electricity the number of kilowatt hours you use per month become cheaper as you step up and start using above more than 150 kilowatt hours which of course most families wouldn't would be using more like 600 to 1000 kilowatt hours plus once you start bringing your, your kilowatt usage below those certain thresholds, you start paying a lot less per kilowatt hour. So my goal for my system was to get below 600 kilowatt hours. I was easily using um, 1,000 kilowatt hours, 800 to 1,000 kilowatt hours. And if I bring mine below 600 kilowatt hours, I suddenly save a lot more money. So we're going to go into a discussion about that. We also potentially... Um, where it becomes more viable particularly for folks in Europe and the States is that you get rebates for your systems in South Africa we don't. So as I said please do pose your, your questions there we're going to cover off things like power factor someone raised a very interesting point about power factor normally power factor is something you don't have to worry about in a private residence because power factor isn't measured by your metering system and the if you have a bad power factor in your house it is the electricity company that takes a knock. That's different for big industry. However, if you're generating your own power does power factor play a part? And potentially it does and that's something we'll investigate. So I'd say start posting comments about the questions that you might have and would like to see answered and I'll certainly be going to far more detail on all the individual components to show what part they play and the different options and pros and cons of each, each of them. Anyway, I thank you very much for following this series. If you do want to follow them, then certainly do subscribe. What does help is if you do give a thumbs up and rate the videos and share them on your Twitter or Facebook feeds. Thanks very much for watching.